Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of The Christian Contrarian. I'm Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, and this is episode 33, The Serpent Seed, part one. And so we've just come off doing a, a two-part series on dual prophecies that's based in prehistory and its importance to history and to the time of the prophet and to end-time prophecy. And in that kind of theme, we're going to revisit a topic that really is a divisive issue with uh, Christians in terms of the serpent seed. And just for the record, uh, I want people to know that I'm somewhat agnostic as to whether or not Cain is the offspring of Adam and Eve, or as many assert, uh, the offspring of Cain, uh, the offspring of Satan and Eve. But I lean heavily to the literal application as the offspring of Adam and Eve. And I leave a small door open. Um, it's not really a big deal to me which way it actually is because I think things kind of work out. But I actually think that the serpent seed is probably fulfilled, that's in Genesis 3.15 by the way, with the uh, giants and the seraphim angels uh, who are the watchers who produce the serpent offspring that look just like the seraphim fiery serpent angels that fulfill that. That fits better for me in terms of my approach to the Bible. And again, this topic is going to sort of underline my approach and help other people hopefully to have an approach where you can test not only what I say, what I believe, uh, but what others say and to help you learn wherever you are on your learning quest in uh, scripture to continue and have an approach that you can rely on. So just sort of quickly, I have a couple of approaches that uh, are important as we go through this and I'll just underline them as a literal approach as opposed to the allegorical approach, which is a Gnostic way of uh, approaching scripture that everything is an allegory and there's hidden meanings and that's what you have to look for. So when there is allegory, it has to be defined with the Bible and the meaning has to fit with the narrative. So that's number one, and we're going to cover a little bit of that in part of what we're going to talk about in Genesis 4 today. And that uh, I believe you have to include all of the passages, so and not just the convenient ones, even the inconvenient ones, and everything has to fit. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. So that's another pillar that needs to fit as we understand everything, and particularly with the serpent seed. I also like to take the Hebrew uh, meanings and take the English back to Hebrew, whether it's in the Old Testament or the Greek in the New Testament, and test the translators to see whether they translated it properly. And the reason why I like to do that is because those words tend to have more than one meaning. And so you have to select the right word or the right meaning and the right English word to communicate uh, that translation that isn't at odds with the rest of the narrative or the rest of the preceding verses uh, that's part of the narrative or in conflict uh, with other passages around the Bible. So there are several different meanings to each Hebrew word that we're going to learn about today and we need to select the right one. And so having said that, we are going to move into uh, Genesis 4 uh, and to look at one of the arguments that people will use to talk about uh, Cain in a way that suggests that he's not part of the lineage of Seth, that there are two separate lineages which suggests that Cain is the offspring of Satan and Eve, as they like to uh, conclude. And so we're going to take apart that, and we're going to have a closer look at it. And they will say that that makes sense because of Targum commentaries. And the Targum was created while Judah, the southern kingdom, was in exile in Babylon. And they developed the Targum, which is an oral commentary that Jesus also spoke against and how the Pharisees applied and reinvented the Bible, mostly through using the Targum as a commentary because they'd lost the Hebrew language for the common everyday language. And the Jewish people uh, had to be taught in Aramaic. 
And so they created this Targum, and that's what comes back. And in that Targum, it clearly says in the commentary, in what we'll cover in Genesis 3, um, that Cain was the offspring of Satan and Eve. So, but we're not going to cover Genesis 3 today. We're going to cover Genesis 4 and work our way back. And again, I have a literal approach. So we're going to start with understanding this argument that Cain and Seth aren't of a different lineage. And we're going to walk through the language of Genesis 4 and start explaining this. So I'm just going to read Genesis 4, 1 and 2 because it's a, it's a perfect place to start. And it'll underline a few of the concepts that I'm talking about. So in Genesis 4, 1, you have Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And in Genesis 4, 2, it says, and she again bare his brother Abel. So we have several words in there that we're going to cover off from a literal perspective and also be taking that back to Hebrew. And that if you just look at some of those words that kind of come rushing forward to support each other. You have the words new, which is yera. You have conceived, which is hera. You have uh, bear, which is yalad. And there's another word I'll be covering off in there as well. But what's important to understand is, is the whole narrative on its face value seems quite clear that Cain is the offspring of Adam and Eve. So let's start with the word new, as in Adam knew his wife. Now new is that word yada, and new actually goes back to two words, yada and eth. So we'll begin with yada, which means to know or to be acquainted with, to understand, to gain knowledge, as in, uh, you know, after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, obviously, uh, Adam and Eve knew that knowledge. And again, we're going to come back to that, not today, but in, in, in the next uh, uh, edition of the, of the Contrarian. Uh, so yada means to know or be acquainted. And eth as in self and in object, uh, and as an object of a bird, of, of a verb. So there's an action. No as an action. So there's two words there, not just the one word. And that's really, really important in terms of the no. And most people have been taught in Christianity that the word, two words to know as in this action with that word eth, as in this object of a verb or preposition, that is an allegory for a sexual relationship. So again, we're into this allegory. So we need to see whether or not it fits to be as being acquainted with, to understand, or does it fit better with to know? And is there another application in the Bible where we can look towards um, the application of to know in that sexual sense? So, and the answer to that last question is yes. So if we have... Uh, Genesis 19 uh, in the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative, then we know that uh, the two individuals who are angels who are being oppressed under Lot's um, household governance by the people of Sodom, they wanted to have uh, those angels come out to know them, to have sexual with them. And just as Lot is offering his daughters for them to know in replace of. So we have that as one of one of the examples, and there are more examples, and I'll come back to that, but just to lay that on the table um, in terms of the word to know as in an action. So the first word, you know, Adam and Eve knew his wife, so they were intimate, and the allegory with the action seems to uh, be there because it's not about... Uh, just becoming acquainted with, because Adam already knew Eve. It's not about understanding knowledge or something, because they have a history. This is something that's different. And so the next word is conceived. And conceived is um, the word hera. And hera means to become pregnant with a child. And this happens from knowing in an action sense Adam. So that seems to make 
perfect sense in terms of the definition and the application of conceived in conjunction with the word no. And she bare Cain. So Adam knew his wife. She conceived and bare Cain. So bear is the word yalad. And that's H3205, and it means to beget, to born, to uh, bear. All in the sense of the word, and there's a few more, but they're all sort of related in terms of, of, of the application of, of bear. And bear also has that same action word, F 853 as new did. So there's an action involved to in, 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 in bearing a process of conceiving as after to know. So again, you have bear cane, you have conceived and you have new and she'd gotten a wife, uh, gotten a child from the Lord. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later today. And so when we look at, um, this, word of seed, as in serpent seed. This is not used in this word, but this is the seed of Adam and Eve as opposed to the serpent. And that, that's the Hebrew word pre, which can also mean um, offspring, produce, and fruit as, as along with seed. So again, we want to make sure that we're selecting the right words and the applications and that it fits with the narrative. And so far, everything seems to be supporting itself almost in a redundant manner so that there is no misunderstanding here. And then again, in Genesis 4, 2, you get the word, the words, and she bare his brother Abel. She is being Eve and Abel being the offspring of Adam and Eve. And if that is not the case, then that means Abel was also a product probably of Satan or other angels. But we don't get much coming from people in terms of that. We're going to come back with that to that concept as, as we go through uh, Genesis 4. And so, um, I'm sorry, I said the word seed was the word pre. That's the word for fruit. That's actually the, uh, the Hebrew word uh, zera, which means fruit, plant, or offspring. And that's the seed that we're going to talk about, not today, um, but probably in part uh, three as we go through this series. So I just wanted to correct that for the record, just so I'm not confusing people. Sorry about that. Again, there's a lot of detail here, there's a lot of weeds, and so we need to methodically sort of go through that. And the word yalad, which is the word bear, uh, it means travai and translated as such 11 times. So Cain was a bear from uh, Eve knowing Adam and conceived. And then through travai or birth time, birth pains, uh, you know, and of course the word also means born from um, yalad or bear. So you see all the words are working towards the same sort of literal meaning that we're getting coming out, out, of, out of the verse. So as we understand this going forward, I want to talk a little bit now about Genesis 4.17, because the Bible tends to be consistent in the language, and so with that consistency, you need to consistently apply the same sort of meanings, whichever way that you're trying to make that go, if you're trying to be consistent. So in Genesis 4.17, we get, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. So if you match that up with Genesis 4.1, where it says Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain, it's the same wording, almost identical. So Cain knew his wife, 
sexually as we understood it. And again, a second sort of testimony to the allegory, also talked about in the Sodom uh, account, uh, talked in with the Sodom account. And she conceived, which is the word Hera, as we talked about, and bear Cain, born, begat. Action words. And again, we now have to look at this and say, okay, if, if we're going to say that Cain was the offspring of Satan, then if the language is, is the same about Enoch, then we have to say Enoch is, comes about in the same way as Cain did, either through Satan or through, in this case, Cain knowing his wife, just as Adam and Eve knew each other. So the literal and Hebrew meanings are testifying that Cain would be born in the same manner that um, Enoch was, and nobody talks about Enoch, son of Cain, as being the offspring of Satan or other angels. And you get the same word coming forward in born that goes back to Yalad in uh, 418 where you've got um, Enoch was, you know, and, and unto Enoch was born Arad, and then Arad begat Yalad again, and all through the lineage of Cain, you get the same language. And it's the same language and the Hebrew words that were being used in Genesis 4, 1 and 4, 2 for both Cain and both Abel. So, let's now uh, just to underline what we're talking about, about knowing, as in Genesis 4.17 and Genesis 4.1. In Genesis 19.5, and this is the Sod account, Sodom account, it says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, We are the men which came into thee this night. Where are the men that, which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Okay, same word, same meaning, same allegory. And that's probably the strange, strange flesh that's being talked about in terms of the angelic flesh that Jude 1.7 likes to talk about. So as we progress, you have a similar support of Scripture and its consistency moving forward as we move into Genesis 4.25 and 4.26. So what it says in th th these verses are this, and again, I'll read it word for word just so that we've got it on the record here. It says in 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. And then in 426 it says, And to Seth, to him, there was also born a son, and he called his name Enos. So again, the language is the same as coming out of Genesis 4, 1, 4, 2, and the same language that is used in the Canaanite line, the Canaanite line. And Adam knew his wife again. Again, it's the same word as used in Genesis 4, 1, yada, with the same application of eth with that action in the same allegory. And again, in 4.25, she bare a son, Yalad, born, a son. So the language is identical. So again, if we don't want to accept that if we want to accept that Cain is the offspring of Satan, then we now have to accept by implication and by consistency in the language that the complete Seth line right down through Noah would be offspring of angels as well and or Satan, which clearly isn't the case or the understanding that we have about the Sethites. 
because the Sethites are the ones who are going to carry forward the commission of Adam in the righteous line. And they're clearly humans. And it produces Noah, and Noah produces, um, you know, three sons and has three wives, and these are the same people that um, we descend back to, you know, from after the flood. And so these are not the offspring of the Rephaim. These are not the offspring of the Nephilim. These are not Satan's created giants. Clearly the passage all the way through Genesis 4 is talking about the same type of creative process from the same type of human parents. So I think Genesis 4 is quite clear that Cain is being told to us in a literal sense, uh, understanding there's one allegory that we've talked about in the to know, um, that is consistent with how we're interpreting and understanding the narrative and other passages, and then reused several times in Genesis 4 to say that Cain is the offspring of Adam and Eve. And there's no mention about Satan anywhere in there. And as I talked about earlier is, is Genesis 4 is used to say, well, why isn't Seth part of the same genealogy as Cain, because, you know, we get Adam's lineage coming down in chapter 5 with the Sethites, and yet you've got Cain in Genesis 4, and they use that to say, see, there's two different genealogies, except that you have to overlook that Seth and his lineage begins in chapter 4, and we get the full detail of it in chapter 5. And it's because you have that in chapter 4, you have to point that out to those that would say it's a separate line. Because they're just trying to say that doesn't exist there in Genesis 4. But clearly, in, starting in 425, after it's talked about the Cain line that's been ostracized, and when Adam was 130 years, so at some point later, so the chronology is the same. And that's why you would have the chronology and then the chronology of Seth's line in another chapter, because it flows in a perfectly linear manner, which again is another one of those pillars that I like to talk about, that the Bible is linear. It begins in Genesis, it ends in Revelations, Revelations is linear. And where you might have, uh, like the book of the prophets that aren't coming out in a strictly linear manner, you get markers where you can insert it. But clearly the chronology and the genealogy is coming out in perfection in Genesis 4, starting with the Cainites, and then later Seth is born, and then after that other siblings are born. And, you know, we don't know how many according to the Bible, but we presume quite a, quite a few. And so we get in Genesis 5 then is Seth inheriting the inheritance and the blessings given to Adam by God. Cain is ostracized, so he replaces them, and he's part of the same generation. And I'll come back to that um, right at the end here. Uh, but anyway, don't let anybody tell you that Genesis 4 clearly says that Seth uh, and Cain are in different genealogy because they're, they're not. They're part of that same narrative and genealogy in, um, in chapter 4, just starting in verse 25. So pretty easy to, to knock that down as long as you take a little bit of time, take a step back, read the whole narrative. And the whole narrative can't be in conflict. And it can't be in conflict with other passages. And everything that we've read here is in perfect conflict so far with the Bible. And we're going to talk about some of the other arguments on another show. But sticking with this and back in Genesis 4.1. If you take the word Cain back to Hebrew, it starts to shed some question marks in place. And I want to cover this off just so that you have this information. And again, we have to understand the, the narrative and the application of the term to, to, under, to understand it. So, 
Cain is H7013 uh, and is defined as Adam's first child. Okay, that seems pretty clear. And it can also mean Kenite, and it can also mean possession or smiths, just as Tubal Cain of the Cain line and offspring of Lamech of the Cain line um, is thought to be a, uh, a smith as well and a metallurgist in, in, in mythology. And all, thus has the name Tubal Cain for that type of meaning. So it's the word possession that uh, people will seize on and they will apply that in uh, to the word uh, gotten which we're going to get to as a possession because it says I've gotten a man from the Lord I've gotten a possession from the Lord and bear Cain which is that uh, and Cain instead of the name would be a bear somehow born a possession that she had gotten from the Lord. So again, there's a little bit of twisting, but where it adds, adds a little bit of credibility is that Cain is rooted in the Hebrew word 7069 Kana, Q-A-N-A-H. And it can, and it means acquired or to create or to buy or to possess. And uh, it's used you know, numerous times throughout the Bible in that sort of aspect as buy or bought or attained. And so now when you have that word uh, gotten, that is the Hebrew word kana. So when you look at how that is uh, applied, then we have to start looking at, okay, I, I understand how there's a little bit in there in terms of the possession aspect that gotten acquired from the Lord as opposed to being um, born. But the thing is, is you've got a double meaning there in terms of gotten where you've got that eth as in, is, is in an action and a preposition that is bare uh, where Cain is born. And so when we look at that in terms of gotten, that is, uh, you know, goes back to uh, the Hebrew word uh, gotten from a man from the Lord, which is Jehovah. Um, and he, it is a, I think it is a, a metaphor for the Hebrew word blessing. Because uh, anything that you get from the Lord is a blessing. And that's the Hebrew word bracha, which is as from God, an inheritance and passed on. Just as you have that as a blessing that is going to be passed on to Seth. So when we look at that whole verse in Genesis 4.1, we have a few of these other meanings with the name of Cain as being possession and gotten as being acquired. We need to see how that fits uh, not only in that sentence, but with the rest of the passage. So does it better that um, Adam knew his wife, and that's an allegory that we've already talked about, and she conceived and she bore Cain, as in born, begat, had through Travai uh, pains, and said, I've gotten the Lord, I got something acquired from the Lord without that conception, without that um, travai and the birth pangs that go along with, with childbirth? Or is that a blessing in the allegorical sense of the meaning uh, from the Lord? And I think that plus the rest of the, the wording that comes out of uh, Genesis 4 with the consistency of people being born by knowing through the whole genealogies that we've covered off suggests that that's a blessing as opposed to being acquired. So again, we have to apply the right meaning to the name. And then in terms of the genealogy that a lot of people will talk about is that uh, they'll bring up uh, some New Testament verses. And in particular, you're, you're gonna get one in Jude one fourteen, which has a reference of Enoch being the seventh from uh, Adam. 
And they're going to say, well, that doesn't make sense because you have Adam, Cain, then Seth. And so I want to start by saying that you get the same genealogy in Luke 3 as you do in Genesis uh, 5. And the numbers are all the same. And the numbers are all the same. And if we start to now look at it and say, how do we count that number? You have to remember that Seth is in the same generation of Cain. And he replaces Cain for the legal inheritance of the blessings and the birthright that uh, Adam initially was given. And Cain is ostracized. It's not another generation. So you go Adam, Seth, leave out Cain because he's been replaced. And he has that uh, rebellious lineage that, that is recorded in Genesis 4 as well. But Seth inherits it as the firstborn son. So that's the second generation. And then everything counts to the seventh as well. So you've got, you know, Adam, Seth, Canaan, Malahel, Jared, and Enoch. That's seven. So again, don't let people move the numbers around. You need to understand how laws and birthrights and inheritance, inheritance were passed on. But the biggest thing to understand in that is the generation. So the next show that we're going to do is going to be on Genesis 3 and we're going to you know walk through that in detail and I think we'll show you some very enlightening things on the next show. So until the next time um, may God bless everybody abundantly and looking forward to episode 34. Mm -hmm.